Hello and welcome to another Invest in GH webinar. I'm your host, Prince Henry Dankwa. This webinar is proudly brought to you by Invest in GH. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Invest in GH is the leading provider of financial news and education in Ghana. Over the past few months, our news magazines and more recently our webinars have been delivered to thousands of people in Ghana and beyond. And would like to thank you all for joining us today for another webinar, another discussion. This webinar was actually scheduled um, earlier this year, but due to circumstances beyond our control, we had to postpone and then have it done today. So thank you all for your patience. Um, our speaker is ready, but then before then, just a few things. The webinar is streaming live on our YouTube channel, Invest in GH. So if you're unable to join us here, or you know someone who is unable to join by the Zoom link that has been provided, I'm sharing the YouTube live link in the chat section here. Just copy it and then send it to that person so that the person can also join us. I can see the numbers are increasing, but we are still expecting a lot more people to join us. So please share the link with your friends and family so that we all get educated. We have a very interesting topic to discuss today. Okay, we've also had discussions about investment in mutual funds, stocks, cryptocurrencies, and real estates. We've discussed how to grow wealth and achieve financial independence. All our previous webinars are available for streaming on our YouTube channel, Invest in GH. So you can visit our YouTube channel, Invest in GH, and then watch our previous webinars there. Please do all to like and subscribe and share our videos to your friends as you do so. Today, we'll be discussing the topic, how to get a home loan in Ghana, how to get a home loan in Ghana. And to take us through this discussion, we have a speaker in the person of Mr. Kojo Adokufo. He's been here before and he's here again. Let me give you a brief introduction of who our speaker is. Kojo has years of experience in investment banking and real estate financing. He is currently the executive head of home loans business at First National Bank, Ghana. In 2006, Kojo co-founded Ghana Home Loans, a leading mortgage specialist and provider of residential mortgages in Ghana, where he served as executive director. A decade later, Ghana Home Loans obtained an investor banking license and converted to GHL Bank, which subsequently merged with First National Bank, Ghana in 2020. Prior to co-founding Ghana Home Loans, Kojo was executive director of SDC Brokerage Services, where he was instrumental in the creation of CM Fund and the listing of Goyle on the Ghana Stock Exchange. Kojo also worked in corporate finance with Citigroup in London and Lagos. Kojo holds an MBA in finance from the Columbia Business School in New York and an MSc in computer science from the University of London. He also has a BSc in Agric Engineering from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. We'll begin with a presentation from our speaker, Kojo, and then we'll take questions afterwards. But if you have any questions to ask the speaker while he's presenting, please do all to drop your questions in the chat section here or under the comment section if you are streaming on YouTube. If you're unable to hear me, please try and connect your audio again. Most of you are now trying to connect. If that doesn't work, then kindly leave and then rejoin and see if that will work for you. If it still doesn't work, then maybe you would have to stream via YouTube and I'm sure you can hear us. All right, so thank you very much. Kojo, can you hear me? Yes, Prince, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can also hear you. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you for joining us today. We are glad to have you. Um, 
Yeah. Can you see? Me? Yeah, I can see you. Hopefully, you can see me too, right? Okay, good. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, right, so then I'll try um, sharing my screen as well, just to. Um, Can you see my screen? Um, not yet. I'm sure it will show up soon. Any, any luck? No, not yet. Still not seeing your screen. Yeah. Uh, technology at its best. Um, Okay, I can see it now. You can see, but can you see my present? Okay, can you see it now? Yeah. You can see my screen. Yes. Presentation yes. mode, wonderful. Right, so thanks a lot, um, Prince and the team, and a good afternoon, or good evening, good morning, wherever you are around the world. Um, I think I should first start by apologizing to those who joined the last time but had to log off because of... Um, connectivity issues. I pray we have much better connectivity this session. Um, and what I'll do is um, I'll quickly go through the presentation. And I've intentionally kept it brief because from experience, I found that normally the questions are even more interesting than the presentation itself. So we, we get through as many questions as is possible given the time um, we have for this afternoon's session. Um, so I'll kind of go through the presentation as quickly as possible, and then um, we, we break into questions. Right, so um, I think as uh, Prince indicated, um, those of you who you know, interacted with us during the Ghana Home Loans GHO Bank days will know we are now part of um, first National Bank Ghana. Um, this, this took place in 2020, um, but still home loans is, you know, remains our passion, and um, we're definitely the industry leaders in that, in that respect. And um, since 2020, um, we've taken a lot of time and effort to go around to explain to people that we are still in the business, even stronger than before, um, still giving products um, to enable people to become homeowners. Um, we've broadened our portfolio of products. Um, we've redesigned the processes to, to make the whole application process more efficient. Um, obviously, we have the whole first national bouquet of products on the retail and commercial side as well. Um, and so it's a whole new experience. And um, anybody who's thinking about um, um, going on this journey, you know, becoming a homeowner, is very much encouraged to do so. Um, I'll quickly go through our products and then through the process. And as I said, we'll have a chat about what individuals on this call are looking to do. So the main products we offer um, are as follows. Number one, the home purchase loan. Now, this is the reason why most people come to us. You know, you start off in life, you either live with your parents or you rent a place, and at some point, it occurs to you that you need to own your own place and you need to buy a house. So we have the home purchase loan, which is designed to address that need. Um, others to take the home purchase loan, not to buy their first property, but to buy maybe a second or a third property um, to you know, either to, you know, to give to family members or as a second home or as an investment. But it's a purchase product for that. There's a homeowner's loan for existing homeowners um, that allows them to release equity. Um, of all the products, this is my personal favorite. If you're an existing homeowner and you need funds to um, support your business or to buy another property or to you know, undertake, um, some, some even use it to pay school fees. You know, your kids start moving out, going to school overseas or somewhere else, and you know, the school fees are quite um, um, considerable, um, you know, 30, 40, $50,000 a, a year. You can release equity from your house, use that to service, to pay the loan, and then service the loan. So we've done transactions like that for, for some of our clients. Then there's the home construction, home completion. In the local market, there are those who choose not to buy, but to build. And normally, um, you know, people come to us when they've started construction or are thinking about construction. So whether you are foundation, you are at lintel, you are almost done, wherever you are on that spectrum, we can give you a facility to complete 
and get all the finishing done as well. So it doesn't really matter where you are, we can take you the rest of the journey. Um, then we have the home refinance loan where um, individuals who are with another institution or they've used their home to take a facility from somewhere else, they want to switch, they can do so. You take a facility from us, pay off the other institution, and then you become our client instead. And there are several reasons why somebody might choose to do this. Client service, for example, is, uh, is the reason that comes to mind. Then there's the land purchase for those who want to buy land. So this is at the very, very beginning of the conversation. You know, you look at the whole home ownership conversation and you decide you want to start with land and then maybe build um, a house um, to your own taste. We give you a, a loan to do that. So you first take the land purchase loan, you buy the land, um, um, prepare it for construction. Then you can come from the home construction loan and then take it from there. So it's, it's um, I see it as, in most instances, it's the first step in the property ownership ladder. Um, and then there's safe to own. Now, safe to own is one that was introduced um, four, three years ago, three years ago, 2018. And we did the safe to, lo safe to own loan to address a specific need. We realized that along the way, in as much as we were able to provide facilities to most of the people who came to us, there was an even greater number who we couldn't um, serve because either they couldn't demonstrate their income sources to us in a satisfactory manner, or the nature of their income is such that it's hard to determine. I mean, so even though the documentation is in front of the credit team, they couldn't really decipher how much these individuals earn. And in some cases too, there were credit related issues which were, which put the application in a bit of a gray area. You know, you can't say yes, you can't say no, um, but you can't quite figure out what is happening. So we came up with a product, which almost is like a, it's a test, right? It's a test to the applicant. We say to the applicant, you, you want a loan, which means if provided, you, you pay say a thousand dollars a month for the next X years. So demonstrate to us that your cash flow can support that obligation. So de demonstrate to us that for, you know, for over the next 12 months, for example, give us $1,000 every month into this account. It's an escrow account, so um, you don't have access to it. We don't have access to it. Um, but put $1,000 in there, and it must be on time, in full, every month for that period. And that demonstrates to us that you, you can do it. It's, I don't think it's the most difficult test in the universe, but at least it demonstrates that you can you can meet the obligations as and when they fall due. And at the end of that period, if we are satisfied that you didn't cheat in the process, in other words, you, you didn't borrow the funds from somewhere else to bring it off, you know, if you actually pass that test, then you know, we go through to credit approval and, and, and proceed and give you the loan. And we've successfully dispersed transactions like that. And I think it's best suited, especially for those in the self-employed stroke informal sector who um, aren't always, um, um, up to date with their documentation, you know, bank statements, um, you know, audited financials, etc. We just use this as a means of allowing them to, you know, evidence-based credit approval, if you like. So that's a new one that joined the stable of products a few years ago, and I'm happy to report that some clients um, have found it useful. In terms of the key product features, um, the amount. So usually. The floor, the least, um, the, the lowest amount we would offer is twenty thousand dollars or the city equivalent of that. And the reason for that is that you know, the, the, the sheer volume of work required to approve each loan makes it economically not very viable if you start doing loans below this amount. Sometimes we consider, but generally this is the floor. Repayment period we give you up to twenty years, and I'm always keen to stress it is up to 20 years you don't have to take the full 20 years even if you sign up for 20 years you don't have to go the full distance you can prepay anytime you want there used to be um, a prepayment penalty which was which kind of started quite steep um, again because of um, the cost of originating these loans it's quite expensive a very elaborate process and so we try to discourage people from taking a loan one year and paying off in six months um, so it started off around about five, seven percent and stepped down to zero over a five year period. That's giving way to a new regime of um, um, 0.25%. I mean, frankly, it's next to nothing. 
So pre pre the prepayment penalty um, that used to be in place has pretty much gone away. Um, in terms of base rates, um, if you take a dollar facility, you're starting off around about 12.5%. Um, if you take a city facility, you're starting off where the reference rate is, um, recently dropped um, just under 14%. Um, plus a margin. So in both cases, there's a base rate and a margin. The base rate is what it is. The margin reflects your credit profile. So depending on um, the type of loan you want, where you live, the kind of property you are buying, how you've conducted yourself credit-wise, um, and a whole lot of parameters, we um, you, we end up with a rate. And normally, you know, if you start off at 12 and a half, you'll probably end up 13 and a half um, plus minus. Um, and then deposit. So if you're buying a property, um, usually you're required to make a down payment. It's good practice. You, know, you, you only want to borrow as much as you can comfortably service. Um, but in the, in the event that you, you don't have a down payment, in the event that you can't contribute towards the purchase, there's a product that allows you to make a 0% contribution. In other words, we fund 100% of the purchase. There are terms and conditions on that one, but generally, uh, most people come in at around 20, 25%, and then we do the rest. Um, and as I said, it's prudent lending. We shouldn't give you more than you can comfortably um, service as, um, as a client. In terms of the application process, it's, as you would expect, it's quite straightforward and quite simple. You know, there's not, you submit an application form which, um, tends to ask for the usual information, who you are, where you live, date of birth, um, the kind of property you are looking to buy, your income details, because all of these will be used to assess how much you are eligible for. Um, we normally come back to you within 72 hours with a letter of intent, which states our intent to lend you the amount you, we think you qualify for. It's not always the same as the amount you want, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a good indication of how much we think you, you're eligible to borrow. Um, if you like the offer or like the intent, you sign and return that to us. The process then kicks off. We go through the documents you've given us. Um, we go through the, um, all the information provided. There's normally a bit of back and forth as we try to get clarity. Um, but usually before long, you get a facility letter, which is, is a, it's a kind of firm commitment on our side that's subject to um, you meeting certain conditions, we are, we are good to go. So, um, so application goes in, letter of intent, letter of intent goes in, facility letter, then we are on our way to uh, pre-disbursement conditions, um, and then we are ready to close and, and disperse. For self-employed applicants, the process sometimes takes a bit longer because of the nature of documentation, you know, the sheer volume, of, um, of, of, of documents that are sometimes provided by, by applicants trying to prove their eligibility. And we normally visit the premises of you know, your business to, just to understand um, what you do and how you do it. I referred to documentation a couple of times. So this is the documentation. Uh, again, it's what you would expect. I mean, proof of ID. Now we have the Ghana card, you know, normally your passport, your driver's license anything that validates your identification. Um, passport pictures, proof of address. So that's normally um, evidence of where you live. Um, and we recognize that not everybody in Ghana can, can provide this. So there is some flexibility there in terms of what is um, acceptable. Proof of income, this is where normally the debate is. So if you're salaried, it's quite straightforward. Your pay slips um, and Evidence that the amounts on the pay slips are hitting your bank account is usually sufficient. If you're if you're self-employed, um, then we really need to understand your income. So your 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 financial statements is a good place to start. Um, we have um, consultants who give us some of the contracts they they they've received from their clients. We have um, some who give us retainers, con you know, various documentation depending on what you do, you know, whether you're an actor or you're a trader, whatever you do, you have some kind of documentation which confirms your income. And that's what we'll be going for. Bank statements going back um, in the first instance, three months, and then we have to sometimes go further than that into the past 
depending on what we see and the questions that arise from, from, from the details on the bank statements. Credit report, um, you may or may not know, but we do have credit reference agencies in Ghana, and we, we, we reach out to them to get evidence of your, your credit history. If you are overseas, we rely on you to run your credit report and send them over. We then have our own way of validating the information you've sent us. We cross-check it. If there's something there we don't understand, we reach out to either yourself or the agency, just try to understand what's going on. Um, and then an offer letter from the vendor, if it's a purchase transaction, um, or any other supplementary information that is required to, to, to make your application um, um, under, uh, easily understood by, by, by our, our guys on credit. Um, we sometimes try to understand what the situation is with name changes and, 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 and other bits of data you've provided which don't quite um, line up next to each other. So um, apologies in advance if either you've gone through this process or you're going through this process and you keep getting questions. And we also, we also ask the same questions when it comes to the title documents. That's a whole different side of the, of the conversation. You know, we are buying a property from, from a vendor who um, maybe inherited that property from their parents who passed away. And then we get into this whole thing about vesting assent and who owns the property. So we, we, we go down into a lot of detail um, if that is necessary. And it's all for your sake. I mean, the last thing you want to do is to buy a property which doesn't have valid title. It gets both yourself and ourselves into a bit of a trouble. So we, we do ask a fair bit of questions only because of the, the, the type of transaction that we are looking at here and the amount of money that is involved. Um, given the amount of work I've just outlined, you would imagine there's an application fee, and there is. Um, the application fee is um, the, the, basically it's down to two. One is the application fee itself, and the other is not really a fee, it's a deposit. And I'll explain that in a minute. So the application fee, 1.25% of the loan amount, um, it's, it covers all the work we do to get the loan processed and dispersed. And then the deposit towards registration, as I said, it's not a fee, it's, um, it's an amount that we hold on account and we use it to transfer title from the person you buy the property into your name. So we take it from their name into your name. That means going through Lands Commission, Survey, um, PVLMD, all those agencies to, to do the necessary one due diligence and two transfer um, processes to make sure that at the end of the day, the property is in your name. Um, and once the property is in your name, we are able to register um, our, our interest as the mortgage provider or we'll put a lien on it, which means, frankly, you can't kind of transfer that, that title again without our, without our consent. So that amount is held on account. Um, given the number of years we've been doing this, we have a fairly good idea how much it costs. Sometimes it ends up costing a bit more because of changes in, in regulations along the way. Um, but we hold this on account, and if we need some more, we'll reach out to you. And if there's um, an excess um, leftover from the, the process. I mean, you get a statement at the end of the process, so you'd know um, how much was used and how much either you owe us or we owe you. But I think in the whole, in, as far as the whole, um, the, the service we offer, I think that's probably um, the, the most value add, the fact that in addition to buying the house, you get, um, we, we do our very best um, to transfer title into your name on your behalf because it's not a process most people would readily um, undertake themselves. It's very painful. Um, so in we decided late last year that 2021 would be declared a year of home ownership. Um, and by that, what we mean is that if you've been thinking about home ownership, if you've attempted it unsuc unsuccessfully, if, you've, um, if you have any um, aspirations in that direction, this is your year. This is the year you're supposed to make it happen. Um, so we've pulled out all stops to make it possible for as many people as 
us would want to be homeowners this year. So no more procrastination, no more listening to your friends who say it can't be done. It can be done. Many people have done it. So, so um, we encourage everybody to, to take that step. Um, if you can't buy a four bedroom house, buy a three bedroom house. If you can't buy three, buy two. If you can't buy two, buy one. If you can't buy one, buy land, do something. Just get on that property ladder and, and do something. No more, no more waiting around. That, that's what this uh, Yoho 2021 is all about. You know, we expect everybody to, to the extent that you want to be a homeowner. I mean, I don't by any means expect everybody in, in the country to own homes, but to, to the extent that you want to do it, this is your year. And uh, First National Bank has dedicated this year to make it happen. Uh, so we've done several things. As I said earlier, we, we've taken a fair bit of time to re-engineer the internal processes. That's ongoing. Uh, we're always open to suggestions to make the process better. We, we reduced our interest rates a bit. We're working on that. We might have another surprise in that direction. Um, we're working with some key developers. We, we have a lot of developers as partners, and most of them have come on board the Yoho journey um, with discounts on the properties that um, they are selling. So if you sign up this year, you get a Yoho discount. Some are quite interesting indeed, and I would encourage you to reach out to our team to see who is offering what so that you can, um, you can benefit from, from these offers. But if you don't remember anything at all from this afternoon's session, remember 2021 is your year of home ownership. Um, other offerings. So essentially, um, we, we've kind of, as I said, we've, we've re-engineered the process. We've, we've, we've made it very, we, we're trying to make it as simple as possible um, for anybody who wants, to, who wants to become a homeowner to do so. We've, um, you know, for some individuals, we realize their income is not enough and they want to borrow with a partner or a spouse. Uh, we encourage that. Um, you know, you have a choice of a city mortgage or a dollar mortgage or a sterling mortgage, depending on, on what, 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 um, what, or, or, or depending on your pref or your preference. Um, I would also encourage that you at least test your eligibility by just submitting a, an ID and a payslip to our team for them to assess and give you a sense of how much you qualify for. Um, your ID allows us to run a credit search. You might find out something in your past that might be of interest to you, credit-wise. Um, we've had individuals who come to us um, not remembering that maybe a loan they thought they had paid off never quite closed. So somewhere out there in the credit world, there's kind of a red mark against your name saying you're not a very good borrower. And it's only when they apl uh, apply to, for a home loan that this comes out. So you might want to sort this out before you apply so that you regularize um, that bit of history. Um, and we've had, we've had visits to various um, um, companies. We've done corporate presentations. Last month of May, we went Kumasi. The team was there visiting sites. So if you want us to come to your workplace, happy to reach out um, and, and, and set something up to come visit you and your friends. And presentations such as this one, you know, um, we're happy to come on your school group platform to speak to you and your friends there. But as I said, it's, it's, this is the year. I mean, this is the year it's supposed to happen for for you, so um, please make sure that um, you grab us and 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 see what we can do for you. So, as far as the presentation is concerned, I think this pretty much gives us a flavor of the process and the requirements and and what is possible. Um, there's a few slides I kind of quickly skip through the case studies. It gives a sense of the kind of properties that are out there. So, this one is. Um, um, Adum City Estates. Adum City is um, COM25. Okay, there are two locations, Kasua for those on that side of town and um, COM25 near Dawenya for those on that side of town, um, just behind Death Traco, COM25. Um, starting price, $28,000 and above. Um, as part of Yoho, I mentioned earlier, they've signed up, they're giving 5% on, on all their properties. Um, I, I'll share this presentation through... Um, uh, Prince, um, Ellie, and their friends, so that you can reach out for, for some of this information. But to qualify for an Adum City property, you should be earning around about five to seven, eight thousand cities um, a month, either as an individual or, or um, a couple. So if you and your partner earn 3K each, you should be able to buy one of these. Um, this is GHS Estates, Kuntun C. This is on the way out of Kumasi, past Pukwase. Um, on the Amasamine stretch, 
Um, that's GHS Estates, um, 47,000. They are giving away 4% on, on Yoho. Um, New Oak, New Oak, um, very prolific developer. They are around Abokobi, Pantai, um, Oyari first side. Um, they're starting from 61,000 for um, th three bedroom detached units. Um, they're given discounts right across on different property prices. Um, again, if you speak to our team, they can introduce you to the right person there to get your discount. Um, Pokwase Heights, this is at Pokwase, 45,000. I think it's two or three bedroom semi-detached, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they're also offering discounts on their properties. Um, and it goes on and on. I mean, um, I wouldn't want to bore you with details, but we have um, those outside Accra as well. Um, Kumase, Takrade, we are speaking to who are happy to participate in this conversation. So, Prince, I think I've done 30 minutes, um, and that's about spot on as far as the, the time is for the presentation. I, I'll just pause here to take as many questions as, as you will allow me to. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Kojo, for the presentation. Um, I think it, it was shorter. I don't know if it's because I'm enjoying it, but it seemed very short. But um, we still have a couple of questions for you. Um, yes. Most of yes. them, I think, they are questions people prepared prior to the presentation. But we'll see, we'll still um, respond to them anyways. Okay. So there is one from Ifwa. Ifwa is asking, um, how easy is it to apply for these loans outside of Ghana? And do non-residents qualify to apply for such loans? Um, it is easy to apply. Um, we have a dedicated team of sales execs who um, you would work with through this process. So you send your information to them, um, you work with them, you send them your scanned documents, obviously, because you're not here. Um, and they, they kind of work with you through the process. They then hand your application through to a mortgage advisor who will um, guide the transaction through credit approvals and through to disbursement. So it is easy and I, I really encourage as many non-residents as possible to do so. And I say this because time was when it was almost impossible, and I should know because I've been there, it was almost impossible um, if you lived outside the country to, to do things like this. Now, because of the internet and you can send documents back and forth, you can have video calls. So it is easy. There's no reason why you shouldn't do so. And the, the, the additional benefit for non-residents is this, um, the title um, registration, um, I, I'm referred to. If you're outside, you might have the funds. You might have the funds to buy a property outright. But how are you going to chase your title documents around Lands Commission, um, get it stamped at you know, um, valuation and work through survey? It's almost impossible unless you have um, a relative or a friend here who really loves and adores you because it's tough work um, and it can be quite expensive. So. If you get that as a byproduct of an application or a mortgage application, I think it's really is value for money. And I've seen some people do a lot of that. You know, you, you normally they come in and borrow just twenty percent of the property value, and you know exactly what they are doing. What what they are saying is that I want you to do the due diligence on this property for me, and I want you to help me transfer title. And I think that's the real value add if you're outside the country, because um, if you're not here, I mean. You are you are quite vulnerable. I mean, that's that's a fact. So please do so. It's quite straightforward. I mean, it's as easy as any loan application is. You know, nobody likes filling forms, but unfortunately, you, you will have to fill forms. Um, and oh, another byproduct before I forget, another byproduct is to get a First National Bank current account. So you get to um, you know that means you have a, a current account in Ghana, which allows you to transact business if you need to make payments or or, or sort out um, your personal. Um, dealings here you know you get a, an account which is um you know, it comes to the mobile app and all the other uh, you know, um, features very very um, formidable set of um, products that come with it so you know i would really encourage you to do so okay thank you very much for your response um Ninote wants to know what is the rate that you charge for public servants 
Um, so mm -hmm. at the moment, the, there was a, I mean, I, I know, so the, the, there was a public servant scheme which came up getting to the end of last year. That was a, a, a dedicated scheme that government came up with. Um, and so that's, um, and I get this question a little that, that's created the impression there's a public servant rate. Um, that was a pilot scheme. Um, we, we weren't part of that scheme. We will be when it, when it returns. But until such time, public servants really get the rate everybody gets until the time that the government scheme comes back for, 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 for phase two. Um, we are, are, however, able to work with groups. So for example, we are speaking to certain um, public sector institutions who are coming as groups and we can negotiate a group scheme for them. But if an individual walks in off the street, then they get the regular um, rate. But and if the government scheme comes in, then we'll get the government scheme rate for those who are eligible. Okay, sure. Um, could you can you please turn your video on for us, or maybe share uh, your screen, uh, just to? Uh, okay, video. Okay. Can you see me? Great. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yep. that's that's better. All right. So the next next question is from. Osman. Osman wants to know um, the interest rates in CDs like you have quoted in dollars. Right, so the interest rates in CDs um, is a, it's a function of where the GRR is. GRR is Ghana reference rate. So it's, um, it's a base rate which um, comes out of BOG. Um, and so if you borrow in CDs right now, you're somewhere around 20% as the base rate. There might be a credit margin to reflect what your credit profile is like. Um, so if your if in the past you didn't service loans as regularly as you should have, it affects your margin. If you are approaching your retirement rate, it affects your margin. If you're so depending on what you're borrowing, where you're borrowing in your profile, it affects. But normally you're around 20%. Okay. Sure, thank you very much. And um, before we continue with the Q&A session, I'd like to say that this is an Invest in GH initiative and we have Kojo Adukufo from First National Bank here with us. We are talking about how to get a home loan in Ghana. So please keep your questions coming. I see a couple of raised hands here. I'll just allow um, Enyimado Samo to ask his question. Samo, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so please go on. Uh -huh. So um, my company, it's a digital integration company, and we are building a platform for consumer financing. And one of our platforms has to do with mortgage and land estates. So we came to First National Bank, and then we, we were told um, the minimum transaction is $20,000 for the land. And then later we made inquiries, and then they told us again that the min uh, the land has no minimum transaction, but the maximum tenure is five years. So it's quite confusing. Which is which? Is it that with the lands we can still do transactions without the minimum transaction of the twenty thousand and have the five years maximum, or for whatever the land is, we, we still have to pay the twenty because our target market is the low and the middle income earners. And then for a price above 30,000, it's very difficult for our market. So with our market of a maximum of 30,000, let's say 40,000, we can't make, we can't get coming for a financing for $20,000. So which is which, is it there's still the $20,000 or we can still come in for a facility for 38,000, 40,000 cities. 30,000, 40,000 cities, not in dollars. Yes, sir. Well, okay, thank you. Well, thanks, thanks for that question, Samuel. And um, I will probably get your contacts um, after this so we pick up this conversation. Um, so I think I touched on the 20,000 uh, minimum amount during my presentation. And the reason I gave for that was um, generally, generally, given the amount of work that goes into each application, we try to keep... Um, the transaction value above a certain amount. Otherwise, you can imagine we'll be doing all this work for like a $5,000 facility and it's, it's just not feasible. 
However, if you're coming as a group, which it sounds like you are, we can have conversations around that in terms of um, the, the minimum amount and also in terms of the, the tenor. Um, you mentioned five years for land. You're right. I mean, not, we, we take the view that normally, given the, given the amounts involved in land purchase, within five years, most people would have finished paying for it so they can get onto the business of construction. Um, because if it takes you more than five years to pay for the land, then maybe it's a bit, that maybe the quantum, the, the amount you're borrowing is too much. So normally we compress it. But, but as a group, we can look into it and see how, how to structure it. Um, so, so let's have a conversation, if you don't mind, offline, and we'll see what we can do for you and your colleagues at work. All right, thank you very much for your response, um, Kojo. Please, I would appreciate it if you keep your questions precise and straightforward for when we unmute you to ask your question so that we don't get confused. I was a bit confused along the way. You know? <laughs> All right. Um, we have another question from Ifwa. Ifwa is asking that what would be the rationale for charging a fee equivalent to a percentage of the amount borrowed? Do you do more administratively when the amount involved is larger? Please provide some examples if you can. <laughs> no, I, no, I think it's a, it's a brilliant question. So um, I think, yes, you see what that there is, there, there's, there's such a thing as origination cost, and um, it is a function of the amount being borrowed. So the answer is yes, more work is done. There's more at risk. Um, you know, somebody buying a one bedroom semi detached house and somebody buying a five bedroom house at Trasaco, the amount of work is different. The valuers will charge more on one versus the other. Um, the, the, the survey people will charge more on one transaction than the other. You will notice that in all of this, I haven't mentioned valuation fee, I haven't mentioned legal fee, I haven't mentioned any of the due diligence fees. That's because we take care of all of that, but we do engage service providers at cost to do all of this. And the bigger the house, the bigger the loan amount, the bigger the transaction, the more they'll charge. So there is a, a, a direct link. There is a direct link between the, 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 the amount being borrowed, the nature of the transaction and, that, and the fees that everybody involved in the transaction, the, external advisors and service providers we use um, will charge. So that's, that, that's, that's a simple answer to it. And then there's also commission we pay to sales, uh, the sales, you know, if there's a sales originator or somebody, it's all linked to the, to, to the, to the loan amount. Okay, thank but, you very but, much. But, but, but just before I, I forget, um, there, there is a, a flaw. So we don't go below a certain amount for the same reason. Because um, even if you're buying a one bedroom studio, the valuers will still charge to go out, the lawyers will still charge to give opinions. So we don't go below um, the equivalent of, I think it's $500, because there is a flat fee, everybody on that transaction will charge regardless of amount. Okay, all right. That's a, it's an excellent question, thank you. All right, we have a raised hand here, David Nyako. David, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, David. Hello. So, please, I joined the uh, presentation quite late, but I want to find out whether it's a requirement to have my salary account uh, transferred to First National Bank before I can assess from your end. Okay. Um, so, right. Uh, thanks, David. Um, so, we... The first thing is you will have to open um, an account with us. That's mandatory. Um, the salary account is also mandatory unless you can give us a reason why that cannot be. And people give us you know, very good reasons why that cannot be the case. And to the extent that it's uh, acceptable, we allow you to um, not to transfer. But ideally, given that you're going to service the loan through this account for your own convenience, you probably want to do that anyways. Otherwise, every month you'll be scrambling around looking for um, to move your money from one account to the other to make sure it's in position before the, the deadline um, for the repayment date. So normally we, we encourage people to do that. And those who don't, you find have to trek to the bank every month and you know, invariably they get caught out 
at some point or the other. So opening an account is is, is mandatory, it's, 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 a, it's a requirement. And as I said, we also, unless you can give a reason why that can't be done, uh, we ask you to move your salary over so that servicing the loan becomes quite straightforward. Um, don't forget, you'll be doing this for quite a few months, at least maybe 120, 180 months, if you go the full term. Okay. Thank you very much, Kojo. Um, I have a question from Michael here. Michael is asking, has Yoho 2021 made the loan acquisition process easier? And what specific measures have been put in place to promote this? Um, it, it has. I mean, don't, okay, so the, the process was already as easy as it could. I mean, let me take a step back. A mortgage application anywhere in the world is never an easy process. So we just need to embrace that truth because you have, you, you know, you're asking for a substantial amount of money. Um, and so the bank has to do a, a fair bit of work to make sure um, the transaction is, is a valid one. So we, so we go through a few set of hoops um, before disbursement happens. But what we've done along the way is to make sure that to the extent that there are necessary delays, to the extent that um, there's duplication, we, we reach in there and fix it. And we've done a fair bit of that along the way, but especially for the purpose of Yoho, um, we've gone through that process all over again. It's not too obvious to use it outside because um, some of the processes are, are done away from, from the client. You know, So we have internal groups that the applications goes through for signatures and things which we've, we've streamlined. What you realize is that you'll get your answer a lot faster than you'd expect. Um, the delays we've had, and I probably have to put this out there before somebody asks the question, the delays we've had in the past six months or so have come from um, Lands Commission. Anybody who's reached out to Lands Commission over the past six months or so would have been told that there's a, there's, um, a system upgrade underway and it's led to some disruption in, in the work being done there. So you, fi you find customers coming to us and because we don't have answers from Lands Commission coming in as fast as we would like, but it takes a bit longer for us to close the deal. That's not from us, that's from um, our partners in, in, in the process, which is um, Lands Commission. But even there, we, we think we found a workaround which, which should minimize the, the, the delays and, and, and the inconvenience. But it's, 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 um, I'll just encourage you to, to test, test the system and you, you'll probably arrive at the same conclusion. Okay, thank you very much for your response, Kojo. Um, Josiah wants to know, in the event of a job loss while applying for the loan, what happens? Um, um, in the event of a job loss whilst applying for the loan, um, again, very good question. So you've applied for the loan in January. It's been approved in January. The house is being built for you, which is normally the case for most people. Um, and the unfortunate happens in March. I think the best thing is to reach out to us, tell us what's happened, ask us to put the application on hold. Um, the conversation you have with your vendor is one, um, I probably, I mean, honesty is always the best policy in these things. I'll tell the vendor that, listen, I can't go ahead because I lost my job. I'm, when I find a new job, I'll come back to you because they, will be building with you in mind. And if you're not there on the day to pick it up, it means they have, a, you know, they have a, a problem. So they need to either find someone else to buy that house or put it you know, on hold or something. But as far as we are concerned, I think the best approach is to tell us to put the application on hold. Um, this is the situation. You'll come back to us when it's resolved, just so that we know what is going on. Otherwise, um, the machine keeps kind of grinding away. And at some point, somebody's going to call you and invite you to come close, only to find out you, you, you don't have the, the income which allowed you to qualify for the loan. I think it's a better approach than pretending nothing has happened and just signing on the mortgage agreements when you know you don't have the income to service the loan because you're going to go straight into default, and that's not a good place to be. So I think you, you're better off just putting the whole process on hold and, and hopefully you find um, another even better job before long and then you bring it back online. 
Okay. Um, Mark is asking if First National Bank has facilities outside Accra. Um, yes, we are in Kumasi, we are in Takrade. Okay. We are in Kumasi, we are in Takrade. Um, Kumasi, if you know where KMA is, we are right across the street. Snake has a building there, we are in there with them. Takrade, we are at Market Circle. Um, um, well, it's a circle, so it's really hard to, to give landmarks, but there's a TLC shop somewhere close to where we are. So but once you hit the circle, if you go around at some point, you will see us. But I mean, the, the, the beauty of the mortgage product is it really doesn't matter where you are or where we are. We can do the whole thing online. I mean, um, I usually give the example of a client we, 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 we did in um, Australia. Um, so he never came to Ghana. We never went to Australia, but we still did the disbursements. He paid it off and, and went on his way. So um, depending on, well, as far as the home loans product is concerned, um, you, you don't really need to physically see us. We can do the whole business um, online. Okay. Um, there's a raised hand, Mike. Mike, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, Mike. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody, and thanks for the platform. I think the team at First National Bank are doing very well. I've dealt with them, GHL, at that point before. My question is this. Um, in terms of, you stated the bit about the land registration bit, and it means that you take the pressure of the customer to make yeah. sure that all those things are dealt with, uh, which is very, very good. My challenge then is then, at the moment, what I'm realizing is you do all that fantastic job, and I have to be honest, you've done, you do a great job on that. But when it gets to the mortgage being fully cleared, you leave the responsibility for the homeowner then to go to a land commission to clear the mortgage off its system, which you stated about the credit scoring. So if it's not off, then it means that anywhere you go, you still have that challenge. Why has that been taken off your system when before it was? Where it was the responsibility of the bank to clear that system off. Thank you. All right. um, thanks, um, Mike, um, for, thanks for the, the kind words and also for the question. Um, I think that there are two questions in there. One has to do with your obligations under the mortgage and the other and, and thanks for bringing this up because I, I didn't touch on it during the presentation. The other has to do with what happens at the end of term as far as the mortgage is concerned. So when you take the loan, um, when you, you apply for the home loan and, and it's dispersed, um, you, you, know, you make a series of payments and, and before long you finish paying. As far as the loan is concerned, it's paid off. We will not report that you owe us. And that, that the evidence of that is what you'll see if you run a credit search at Dun & Bradstreet or XDS or any of these places. So that's one kind of conversation. The other one has to do with land commission because, and you're right, I mean, when you take the loan, we do the title transfer, we plot our mortgage uh, interest on the property. So anybody who does a search will see that the name, that property belongs to Mr. Mike, but it's, um, there's, it's been mortgaged to, to us. That is there. When you pay it off, what we do is we give you the deed of discharge, which means as far as we are concerned, here is a letter that says you no longer owe us, you are discharged. Now, what you are asking us to do, and it's a conversation I'll raise with the team, we've actually spoken about it before, but I'll raise it again because of this question, is why don't we go ahead and plot that as well? Um, that's because that's not factored into the, into the service. Usually it ends when you make your last payment and we give you a letter saying, congratulations, you no longer owe us, we're done. Here's evidence of it. You go and plot that at Lands Commission. Not everybody does it. And if they don't, then you're right. What you're saying applies. Um, the, the, um, if somebody subsequently runs a search, they will see our name there. But again, if they were to write to us, we'll, we'll show them evidence of having discharged that mortgage a long time ago. Um, there are two schools of thought on that, actually more than two, um, but maybe it's, it's worth bringing that conversation up again to see 
where responsibility lies on that. So thanks for that. Okay, thank you very I much. I don't think that, that's very clear to everybody, but it, it just it's, it's a question of whose job it is to go back to lands commission and plot the deed of discharge, which says the loan has been paid off. Normally, we let the client do that. That's the habit of the bargain. Um, but I think what Mike is saying is that we should do that as well. Okay, sure. Um, Abna Sika, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Okay, so um, um, thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I have a question. I think I joined the conversation at a certain point where a uh, mention was made of um, um, a couple joining forces to be able to take a loan to uh, finance uh, purchasing a house. And then there was a set amount that was mentioned. Now, what I wanted to ask was that, does that mean that there's a set limit for how much can, um, how much you are supposed to be earning in order for you to be eligible for a loan? And if there is, then what is said amount? That's what I wanted to know. Um, so the question is, is there a certain amount you must earn to be eligible? Uh, well, the answer is it, it really depends. I'm, I'm normally very reluctant to put numbers out there because normally they get misinterpreted. Essentially, what you are, what, how much you, you, are, you qualify for is a function of how much you earn. How much you, are, you want to borrow is a function of the property you are buying. The, the comment I made about joint applications was to say that if you don't qualify with just your income, you can submit a joint application with a spouse or a sibling. Usually, we are reluctant to do um, um, kind of random joint applications. So two people who can work together decide they want to buy a house and submit a joint application. We, we tend not to do that um, because usually find along the way, you know, they might decide that they're no longer friends and then nobody wants to take responsibility for the repayments. Um, that's not to say the same can't happen for a married couple, but at least it's slightly more difficult for for a married couple to kind of walk away from each other than it is for office meets, if, if you see what I'm saying. So usually the, 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 the nature of the bond is what um, we, we examine to see how, how, um, how um, lasting or how the solid it is before we accept the joint application. Um, having said that, you, know, you're, you will both still be jointly and severally liable um, once um, the loan is put in place. But, you know, Usually, I mean, if you, to, I'm just kind of struggling to answer the question. If you, you know, if you are looking to borrow the, the minimum amount of twenty thousand dollars, you should be earning somewhere in the region of about, about I'll say about six, seven hundred dollars a month. Um, but that isn't a very meaningful answer because I don't know if twenty thousand is what you're looking to borrow, and I don't know if twenty thousand helps you buy the property you are looking to buy. So. The answer is more along the lines of what are you looking to buy? How much do you earn? And then we can tell you how much, what percentage of the house value we can help you with. Maybe we can do 60%, maybe we can, we can do 70%, maybe we can do 100%. So it depends on what you're buying and how much you earn. And if you, what you earn is not enough, who you can borrow with, that's acceptable to us to enable you to do so. Okay, thank you very much, Kojo. Then a follow-up question is then if you are earning less than 3,000 Ghana CDs a month, would you be eligible for a loan? Okay, so that's why I said I'm normally reluctant to put numbers out there because it becomes the fixation of the question. So it, it depends. There was an earlier question from, I think it was Samuel, who said he, his, his office colleagues were looking to buy some land. Now, he might then think, oh no, I earn less than 3,000, I'm not eligible. But then again, he might be because they are looking to buy land and maybe there's something we can do for them in that respect. So I'm normally very reluctant to put salaries out there because everybody's request can be different. We've done um, transactions where people have come to us as a group and they are, um, 
they, they, they've been approached by someone who's selling land for 20,000 cities a plot, right? So ordinarily, it wouldn't do less than $20,000, but because of the number of people in that group, because of the nature of the request, um, we sought a waiver on that requirement and, and were able to do that transaction. And some of their salaries were below the 600 or so dollars I just mentioned. But it was enough to enable them buy what they were looking to buy, right? So it depends on, it's a case by case thing. Um, and, and as I said, I, I just encourage individuals to reach out to our team. Um, and I, I think I need to put out the details um, at some point, um, just so that you can have that conversation with them and find out what it is for you in, in the context of what you're looking to buy, if it's a house or a plot, a plot of land. Um, and then we see how we work things out. Okay, great. Thank you very much. In the spirit of that, we would like to say that the presentation for this um, discussion will be made available after the webinar. Please do well to visit our YouTube channel, Invest in GH, and watch the webinar. If you missed anything, kindly do well to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and share our videos with your friends and family so that they can also enjoy and educate themselves on how to get a loan. We also have other webinars on our YouTube channel that you can watch. Also, we we as Investing GH has a WhatsApp group that you can join and also um, receive daily business news and financial updates. Also, we send out magazines and links to our various webinars. I'll make the link available on the chat section here and also on under the comment section on YouTube. Please do well to copy it and join our WhatsApp groups. You can also visit our website, www.investinggh.info and register with us if you haven't done that. The details and co the contact details and um, any other information from the speaker, Mr. Kojo Adokufo will be made available to everyone. Um, particularly our subscribers and those in our WhatsApp groups after the webinar. So please do want to join our WhatsApp groups if you haven't done that. All right, back to our question. Um, we still have a lot of questions, Kojo, so I'll run them through um, quickly. One is from John. John wants to know, will you go through the same application process if you want to build a house to sell? Ah, um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but if the question is, if somebody wants to take a facility from us to build a house to then sell, um, I don't know if that's the, is, is, do you think that's the question? Yeah, that's the question. Right, if somebody wants to take, um, so the, <laughs> The process as far as the loan would be the same because you're taking the facility from us to build a house. Um, so it's our money going into the construction of a house. The process will always be the same. The, the point of departure will be at what stage are you looking to sell this house? Is it whilst you are building or after you finish building? Because I mean, that, that then changes the nature of, of your request. Um, and to the extent that it's more than one house, it might be perceived as a commercial transaction, which is a totally different category of um, of, 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 of products, you know, commercial fine, uh, construction finance. So it really depends on, on how it is presented. But we have had individuals who have come to us, borrowed money, built the house, started servicing the loan, and at some point tell us somebody's bought the house, therefore they want to pay off the loan. You know, the effect is the same. They bought the house, they, they built the house and sold it. Um, but it's hard for us to know whether they set out with that objective or not. But if you want to take a facility to build houses on a commercial scale, that's a different conversation. But if it's a single house that you're looking for money to build, then the process will be the same. And we'll be looking at your income to service the loan, not the prospective buyer, not the, the individual you think at some point will come and buy the house. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Kojo. Um, another question here from Godfrey. Can you use your tier two pension to secure a loan for the mortgage? I mean, to secure a mortgage. Um, that's, that's a good one. I mean, we have, we have looked at that. Um, the first, so I, I, mean, I assume everybody knows what tier two pension is. I mean, there are three tiers of pension. One is with SNIT. Um, tier two is with your um, your private um, pro um, pension provider, and then tier three, if you have it, is almost like um, the old provident fund. So that's one that your employer will also set up and manage either with a private a private pension provider or maybe in house if they choose to. But the the tier two as as a means of securing the facility. We, we, are, we don't think we have the perfect solution yet. Don't forget, when you take a facility from us, your, the house is always the collateral. The, the house you're you are buying or building is always the collateral. So under normal circumstances, no additional collateral is required. So if we need to reach for your tier two, it means the house is inadequate or there's something inadequate. And we, we know circumstances where that might be required but we haven't quite designed the perfect solution for that. So the simple answer is, yes, it can be done, but given that the house itself is a collateral and normally the house should be more than enough, um, the tier two will be an overkill. I mean, you, by giving us your house as collateral, you've done what you need to do to, 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 to qualify. Okay, great. What if the house doesn't belong to you? That's a follow-up question. Maybe it belongs to your brother. Or your husband, right? So we don't do third-party collateral. In other words, if you are looking to buy a house, the house will belong to you. If you are giving us house as collateral, in the case of a homeowner's loan, you know, raising equity for the reasons I gave earlier, it has to be in your name. So either your brother or your husband transfers the house into your name or they can step forward, borrow, and give you the proceeds. Either way, um, we end up dealing with the person whose name is on the documents of the house. We don't give a loan to someone and use property in another person's name. We don't do that. Okay. Some institutions do, we don't, we don't, yeah. Okay, Caleb, can you hear me, Caleb Darcy? Yeah, hello. Yeah, Colin. Hello. Can, hear you. can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, um, sir, um, my name is Caleb Daze, Caleb from Advaka. Um, uh, I'm a salary worker. I earn uh, 1,000 Ghana CD in my salary, and I want to buy an investment property, purposely to buy and rent it out. Can that be possible, please? Um, I, okay, so I am sure there's something we can do for you. I'm just not sure how much this income will qualify for you to borrow. Um, happy to have that conversation. I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, um, but I can get my, if you reach out to me, um, or, I'll, or I'll get your details from, um, from Pris, um, we can have a conversation around the amounts you're eligible for, and then and take it from there. Um, it depends, as I said, it depends what you're looking to to, to invest in and and how much um, salary is required to to to, to do so. Um, but you know, again, just you know, you raise a, a very important point there. You said your salary is a thousand cities. Normally, when we look at when we look at applications, we look at income. So we will look at your salary. We will look at any allowances or benefits or overtimes or bonuses or commissions you earn in addition to this salary and use that to form the complete picture of your income profile and then decide how much you qualify for. So you might find it's thousand, you might find it's more. By the same token, if you have um, long-term financial obligations, if you borrowed from some other institutions and you're servicing those loans, then it means for all intents and purposes, you you don't earn a thousand, you earn a bit less. 
because every month you have to service those loans. So we take all of that into account and then tell you how much um, we think you are good for. Okay, thank you. Um, Francis is here. Francis. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can. can. Okay, so I have two questions. Um, the first one is, uh, during the application for construction mortgage uh, facility with FMB, uh, there is the registration fees and the registration deposit for stage one and then uh, conversion fees in stage two. Can you explain at what stage, you know, these fees are collected, whether before the loan is disbursed or I, I want to understand at what point these fees are collected. That's my first question. Um, the second question, again, uh, as a follow up on this construction mortgage is um, who selects the contractor? Is it FMB? or the, the one taking the loan? Or does FMB play any role in, in, in the selection of, of the contractor? And uh, does FMB disperse the money to the one taking the loan, or you would disperse the money to the contractor if it's uh, a construction mortgage? Thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks, Francis. Um, um, you know, um, okay, let, let me try and answer the questions in reverse order. So um, the disbursements are done on a case by case basis. Um, and, and thank you very much for raising this because I kind of glossed over it during the presentation in the interest of time. But the disbursements are done on a case by case basis, um, depending on the, the, the transaction, depending on how far along you are, depending on uh, the perceived risks, how close the the borrower is to the property. Um, you know, there's a whole set of um, considerations that are taken into account before we decide whether we disperse directly to the borrower or we dis disperse to the service provider they have selected. So that's your answer. We don't select them for you. You select them yourselves. Um, and you tell us, give us a sense why you decided to go with, with, with your chosen contractor or, or service provider. And we do that so that, um, you can't then turn around and say, the contractor you gave me um, is messing up with my, my property. So essentially, it's somebody you know and trust. Um, and then um, you bring them to us and we, we, we work with you. you know, it's, it's a three-way conversation, you, us, and the, and the contractor. And then depending on how it goes, we either make disbursements to you or to, or to them directly. We tend to make direct disbursements in the case of purchases. So for example, if you say you're buying tiles from Kimo or West Africa Hardware, chances are the funds will go straight to them. If you are paying your regular steel bender, then we'll probably give you the money to pay them. You know, so it really depends on, 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 on where you are in the process. But it is a staged disbursement, just to make sure that um, as the money goes in, the property comes out of the ground. Um, that, that's one of the risk mitigating features we've put into that product. Um, in terms of the fees, um, the, so let me start with the conversion fee first. Um, when, you, when you apply for construction mortgage, it's, it comes in two stages. There's a construction phase and the mortgage phase. So normally we give you up to a year to finish the construction phase. So wherever you come to us at, whether you are foundation, block work, lentil, roofing, we have a period of a year, up to a year, for you to, to get to completion stage. And because the funds are available, we expect this to be possible. Um, and by completion stage, I mean your windows, doors, roof, um, electricals, plumbing should be there. In certain instances, credit puts in one or two additional features they expect to see before conversion. And if you have a problem with those conditions, I, I would advise you raise your hand we have a conversation around that. But once we lock it in, it becomes a condition. If, if it's not done, we don't convert. The beauty of conversion is that at that stage, your interest rate drops from the construction fee, which is usually 18, 18 and a half, down to 12 and a half or 13 or whatever your rate is. The reason for the construction finance fee being, uh, interest rate being higher is because it is a very risky phase. Anything can happen. And we've um, 
we found ourselves in some sticky situations on some of these transactions where, um, you know, for a host of reasons, the construction just kind of grinds to a halt. So normally we, we try very hard to get our clients out of that phase into repayment phase as quickly as possible. So the conversion fee is applicable then, you know, an inspection is done, um, valuers come around, make sure that everything is, is there ready for conversion. And then we flip it into the mortgage phase and then you're good to go. The, the registration deposit is normally collected before. So the other fees is before disbursement takes place. Um, um, but once disbursement takes place, then the only other fee that kicks in is conversion, which is what you pay at the point where the construction is deemed to be over. And now you are, the house is habitable. It's, it's a very broad definition of, of completion. I mean, we don't mean you've put in curtains and, 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 and finish and everything. You can come to us way before that stage. It's just that we want to make sure the house is secure, it's habitable um, in, in, in the broader sense of the word. And then we allow you to um, complete at your leisure. So the final completion is done at your leisure and at the reduced mortgage rate. Okay, thank you very much, Kojo. And since we are discussing home ownership and construction and mortgage, I'd like to bring to your attention that Invest in GH also has an initiative called Hid Homes Limited. Um, Hid Homes provides compelling real estate proposition to customers. Services include architectural drawings, property acquisition, general and building construction, and other legal services. Hid Homes can design your home and construct it for you at affordable prices. We'll make um, available the contact details and other documents related to Hid Homes um, after the webinar to all our subscribers so that you can also talk to them and then um, find out how best they can serve you. All right. On to our question. Um, we have one from Edu. Edu is asking, if you are at the roofing stage of your construction process, can you service um, a loan to complete the process? Um, if you are at the roofing stage, can you access the loan to complete? Yes, yes you can. Uh, yeah, you okay. can. I mean, definitely. Um, some even come much further along than that. Wherever you are, to the extent that there's some work left to be done, you can you can apply for a completion um, loan. Okay, great. And um, there's a raised hand here, no name, but um, I'll still unmute you so that you can ask your question. Can you hear me? Galaxy A12. Okay, um, let me go on. Boniface wants to know what percentage of down payment is required for a self-employed person who wants to access a mortgage facility? Um, I, as I explained earlier, um, even though it's considered good practice for the, um, for the home buyer to contribute to the purchase, we have a facility which makes it possible for you to borrow 100%, which means no down payment. So you can either do that or make a payment of anything up to um, some coming at 50, 60%. And it really is that flexible. Um, there is, you know, above, above a certain amount, um, above a certain amount, you'll be required to take an insurance for the contribution you were supposed to have made, which you didn't. It's called CRI, and, and if you do apply, the team will explain it to you. But otherwise, it's possible to borrow all the way to 100%. Um, but, but the advice is only borrow what you can comfortably service. If you can't service 100% of the house price, I wouldn't ask you to. Borrow what you can comfortably service, um, which means you have to make the down payment and if you can't make the down payment, then you might have to look at the numbers again and probably buy something slightly lower price. But it's good practice not to borrow more than you can comfortably service. It only gets you into difficulties. 
Um, but as I said, once you approach the team, they will explain to you how to go all the way to 100% of the, of the loan amount or the, or the house price if, 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 if that's what you want. Okay, great, great. Um, Kwejo is here. Kwejo, can you hear me? Kwejo Poku. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, hi, Kwejo. Kojo, can you hear me? Okay, I think hey. we lost Kojo. I'll just Hello? take the... Yeah, hi, Kojo. Okay, I'll just take the next question here from Ralph. Ralph is asking, are the loans yeah, insured? And what happens if okay. an individual is unable to service the loan per the agreement? Can you hear me? Hello, Kojo. Hello. Um. Yes, I can hear you, Kojo. I don't know if you. I think he has a bit of a connection issue. Right. Okay. So the question is: Are the loans insured? Yes. And what happens if someone can't service their loan? Yeah. So, um, you know, thanks for that. Um, the the loans are the, the the borrower, the applicant on the on the home loan application is required to take insurance, but that is not to insure the loan in the sense that it's been alluded to. In other words, when you apply for a home loan, you are required to take um, insurance to secure the property against um, fire, um, accidental damage. So it's property insurance, basically. Um, there used to be a requirement for life insurance that is being phased out. So that's another good news from the Yoho campaign. So that life insurance requirement is being phased out. Um, the life insurance, even though it's being phased out, we still encourage individuals to you know, voluntarily take it on their own, but as a requirement, it's being phased out. That usually takes care of um, um, temporary disability, permanent disability, and death. It pays out on the event of those. The property insurance pays out if your property is, um, you know, there's a fire or there's some damage done to the property. So those are policies which the, the homeowner, our client, takes out and the policies are you know, renewed every year whilst the mortgage is still in force. Now, that takes us to the second part of the question. What happens if the person then defaults? Now, that's a credit situation, which is different from a temporary disability or permanent disability or you know, fire or death. If you go into default, either because you lost your job or some other situation, then... Um, the, you, you, first off, you need to kind of raise your hand and tell us what's going on. Secondly, we would work with you to resolve it. And at some point, if there's no resolution, then unfortunately, we have to go through the, the judicial process to foreclose on the house, recover it, um, sell it, and then um, recoup our initial um, loan facility to the extent possible. Normally, by the time it's gone through the whole um, delinquency process into default in, into the courts, a solution has been found. Either the individual has secured a new job or they've sold the property themselves and the loan has been liquidated. Normally, it resolves itself. But in the four or five percent um, of cases, we go to the full distance. And unfortunately, we have to secure the house and, and, and sell it to, to, to pay off the loan. So that's, that's what tends to happen. But there isn't an insurance that that um, that addresses that particular scenario. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Jude is asking, is it possible? Okay, and uh, Matthias wants to know, would would I be allowed to occupy the house while payment is ongoing? Absolutely, the house is yours, and thanks for raising that because I mean, 
I think sometimes I take these things for granted. It's a very good question. When you buy the house, when you apply for the loan and the loan is dispersed, the house is yours. I mean, it's just like if you take a car loan, you don't finish paying for the car loan before you start driving the house, before you start driving the car. Once, you, once, um, once we sign on the line and we close the transaction, you can move into the house, you can paint it any color you want, you can grow all the trees you want, it's yours. It's, you know, the only difference is if somebody were to do a search at Lands Commission, they will see that it's you know, into brackets, it's, your, your name is there because we, we, we plot your name there, and then into brackets, mortgage to First National Bank. That's the only difference. But for those who haven't done a search at Lands, there's no way they would know unless you tell them um, that you, you took a facility from us. So the house is yours. It's yours to, um, to enjoy, to maintain. Um, but the key thing is to make sure that the repayments are kept um, on course. Um, but it's, that's your house. You don't have to finish, finish paying for it before you move in. Okay, great. Um, we have Joshua. Joshua, can you hear me? Okay, um, I think we lost Joshua there. John, John Philip. John, can you hear me? All right. Um, please, can I ask my question? Yes, please. Go on, John. Hello? Yes, John. Can I ask my question? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, good evening. Yeah, my question is uh, about the interest uh, rate. Please, how is it... Uh, the, how is it? Um, how is the payment done? Is it supposed to be compounded or is it just a simple interest rate? And also, is uh, is F and B in the position to investigate uh, a facility that one would like to buy to see to it? authenticity before uh, um, the, the, the payment uh, is done. Uh, I would like to hear the answers to those questions. Thank you. Okay. Right, thanks, uh, Joshua. Um, so the first question is on the interest rate. Is it simple or compounded? Um, so when it comes to um, structured facilities, which is what the mortgage is, um, there's a, it's a very, there's a way it's done where the loan amount, the interest rate, the repayment period, um, there's a standard formula that is used to calculate it. And the purpose of that is to make sure that you pay the same amount every month for the duration of the loan. So you, if you know the loan amount, if you know the interest rate, if you know the number of months that the payment will be made over, um, and the frequency of payments, you can, you, you know, there's a formula that is used to do it. And as I said, the net effect is that you pay the same amount in month one as you pay in month 240. So if you take the loan and we tell you that you are paying us $100 a month this month, you will pay us that same $100 20 years from now when the world will look and feel a lot different. You'll still be paying the same $100. And the way that is done is it's structured such that every hundred you pay, part of it goes to principal, part goes to interest, right? Um, and the reality is that in the early months, it's more interest than principal. Then at some point, it switches over, then it's more principal than interest. So that's how it's done. I mean, it's a standard formula, and, and I'll invite you to, to kind of check it out online and see how it works. Um, so th that, that's, that's how it's done. The second question is, um, does um, First National have the capacity to check out the property you're looking to buy in terms of, uh, it sounds like due diligence. Can we conduct due diligence on the property? That's how I understood the question. The answer is yes. But the caveat is that you, the buyer, it's your primary responsibility to do this because you brought the property to us. 
we didn't invite you to buy it. So by the time you bring it to us, we assume you've checked it out. And if you haven't, then you should. We do our own checks for our own internal processes, but we rely on you to, to satisfy yourself that this is a house that you want to buy. All we are doing is giving you the money to buy it. We, for our own, as I said, risk and credit processes, we conduct our checks and satisfy ourselves in-house. But you really have to make sure that you are happy with it. So if you have any doubt whatsoever in your mind that um, the property is not right or the vendor looks a bit shifty, um, please don't bring it to us. Walk away. But we conduct checks as well. And if we see anything we don't like, we will tell you what we see, why we don't want to do the transaction. And um, you can proceed if you want to, um, not, with, not with our money though, um, you can proceed to buy it if you still want to, but we'll tell you what the issues are. Sometimes it has to do with root of title or some conflicts or some other situation that came up in our due diligence, but the primary responsibility is on you. Okay, thank you very much, Kojo. Um, Joshua is back. Joshua, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, please go on. Yeah. Please, I want to ask if um, First National Bank can help guarantee a uh, product from a supplier. Because I'm a broker to suppliers and uh, uh, buyers. That is, as I'm speaking now, I'm in Burkina Faso, um, sourcing some products. I do in farm products like maize, soya beans, and other things. So I want to know whether First National Bank can help me um, guarantee for products from suppliers, and before then, a contract of both uh, a supplier and the buyer will be given to First National to just do due diligence about this um, supplier and buyer. Thank you. Right. I mean, there is some, it's definitely something we can look at. I mean, your question is, can we offer a bank guarantee? Um, we can. It's it falls slightly outside the topic of this afternoon's conversation, but it's definitely something we can look at. And to the extent that um, we can structure something, I'm sure we can. We, we can. we can be of help. So um, maybe we can we can touch base outside of this, and I'll get your contacts from Prince, and we, we pick it up from there. Okay, great. Um, Ernest is asking if he can rent out or use the house for business whilst he still services the loan. Yes, okay, you can. Very good question. So you can. Um, you just have to give us notice. We need to know. You also need to let your insurance company know. Um, I talked earlier about property insurance. It's important if you're going to do this to let your insurance company know, you should let us also know that the property you used our money to buy is being rented out to Mr. X or Mr. Y. We are currently in court with a client on exactly the same issue. So thanks for raising it. Um, somebody took a loan from us, bought a house, and without our knowledge, rented it. Nothing wrong there until the tenant set fire to the house. So now we have a situation because our collateral is burnt. We didn't even know it had been rented out. Um, I presume somewhere in there, the insurance companies will probably shrug their shoulders and say, well, this property wasn't supposed to be rented out in the first place. So it, it, it brings all kinds of issues. So you definitely need to let us know. I mean, we're all reasonable people and I don't think that consent will be withheld. But I mean, we need to know that you're doing this. And more importantly, the insurance company needs to know You've made it a rental property, so the risk profile has somewhat changed. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, SN is also asking, as a salaried worker, does your employer need to approve your loan facility before you are granted one? And are the deductions made right from the source of income? Um, no, we really don't have to deal with your employer and more often than not, they, for reasons that I totally understand, most people don't even want, want the employer to know they are buying a house. So normally the employer is not part of the conversation. If, if we have to confirm employment, you know, some, we, we may have to put a call from time to time to 
HR just to confirm that you do work there or you still work there because maybe you've moved on. Um, but no, we don't rely on your employer for the monthly repayments. It's your responsibility. It's your job to make sure the, the amounts get to us every month, which is why to the earlier question about whether your salary should be with us, I did mention that um, you know your life is a lot simpler if you, you transfer your salary so that every month you just set up a standing order from your current account to service the loan. It makes it makes life very easy all around. Okay, great, great. Um, Kojo is also back. Kojo, can you hear me now? Okay, um, unfortunately, I think we might have lost Kojo. Hello? <laughs> Samuel, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I wanted to ask my company initially. I made a statement that it's a consumer financing program. It's a mobile app we are launching, and then we have one for building materials and construction materials. But this is a case where the client wants to be pre-financed by the bank, by the bank, and then the bank deducted from the client's payroll over a tenor period. So this time around, the the money has to be paid to us, the vendor, on a loan basis which is agreed by the client. And then the, the bank will deduct it from the client's bank account um, per the tenor period, probably maximum by five years. Unlike the conventional loan where you pay the client for the client to come and pay us, we might transcate the business. So this time around, we, are, we have already, already arranged with some of the banks. They are paying us the money directly. We supply the item and then they do the premium deductions over the tenor period. So we want to know if we can have the same arrangement with First National Bank with concern of um, uh, construction and building materials at the higher purchase. Um, yeah, that, that should be doable. So as I said, let me get your details offline and then probably see how we can do this. Okay, okay. I'll, 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 I'll give it to you um, and then we discuss that. All right, right thanks. Sure. Um... If you have any more questions, I think we first just the time um, at the moment. We've done an hour and 37 minutes. Still have a couple of questions. So we'll take maybe the last two and then we can conclude. Um, if you still have questions that have not been answered, don't worry. We'll make available the contact details for Kojo and then the First National Bank, Bank Market Desk so that you can contact them and have your questions answered maybe within the week. Nathan wants to know what are the clear steps a realty company will take to secure mortgage arrangements from Ghana Home Loans? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I understand that question. Um, the steps who would take? Um, I think a company that buys and sells houses. Right, so, okay, if I understand it, so you have like a, real, a realtor, somebody who yeah, buys and sells some property as, as an agent, and maybe they have individuals yeah. who come to them looking to buy houses. We do have that arrangement with some of them. So if you're in the business of, buying and selling houses on behalf of clients you sometimes have, you know you get the mandate to sell a house and someone is interested but they don't have the funding um you can bring them to us and obviously we'll, we'll um, provide them with the necessary um support if they are eligible and to the extent that we you want to have a standing arrangement on this we can even have a referral fee where we pay you um, a commission for doing so so we, we can look into that then. Okay, great. Um, we'll be taking our final question from BJ. BJ, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Yes, I can. Oh, yeah. All right, okay. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, very well thought out and very well uh, structured. 
Uh, three questions. Um, you mentioned uh, rates, right? And you also said, depending on your uh, credit score, and that will determine the kind of rate you're going to get. Now, is the rate subject to negotiation? Suppose you have a very good uh, credit score. And uh, my second question is, um, if you have an old facility with a uh, Ghana home loan and you virtually finish paying it off, can you then arrange for a new facility and how easier can that be? And the last question, you also mentioned um, when you open a, a facility with Ghana Home Loan, you do get an account, um, a current account, whereby you can use that to do your day-to-day -day transaction, especially if you're living outside. Now, with that, is there any charges on such accounts? And um, that will be all. Thanks very much. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for that. Um, so the question is, can you negotiate your rate? Um, usually, it's it's pretty standard. I mean, to negotiate means there's a basis for negotiation. Um, yeah, I mean, to the extent that you think we've overlooked something which should influence the rate, um, you can open up that conversation and and normally goes into credit and and, and, the, and the responses obtained. So it really depends on um, why you think the rate given to you shouldn't be, or is not the right rate, and um, and other features which or factors which you think were not taken into account. So happy to to engage in that conversation. Usually it's quite difficult to shift the rate. I can assure you, but I mean to the extent that there are good reasons, we, we can look into it. Um, old fast. So yes, I mean we we we've done quite a few of those, uh, and and thanks for raising that that one too. So we have people who took a loan maybe six seven years ago, have paid down and want to borrow some more, for whatever reason. It's called the top up, right? So we 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 go back to that old facility, revalue the property, and see how much headroom there is to lend some more against it, and it's the easiest transaction because. The collateral is already known to us. The, the client is known to us. And all we need to know is whether you know, the extent to which your circumstances have changed and hopefully change for the better because obviously you would have been promoted at work or you would have moved on to some other job which is slightly better paying than the old one. So normally it's easier for us to, to do those top-up transactions quite quickly. Um, and we, we have, as, as we speak, we do literally have some of those um, coming through. Um, and the other question is, um, if you open an account with us, what are the charges? They're pretty much standard charges, you know, um, for your your card and your current account. And we are actually launching a series of savings accounts right about now. So depending on the account type and how you run it and whether it's platinum or regular or gold, you know, the, the, the charges differ. But the important thing is, if you didn't already have an account in Ghana, you now do. So you can you can make payments and and receive payments and and manage your affairs locally without um, reference to your your account wherever you are, especially if you're outside the country. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, Kojo. Um, it's been a wonderful session with you. Um, unfortunately, we have to bring it to a close but we will still continue hopefully within the week. I'm sure you get a couple of calls and text messages from a few of the audience here. Those who couldn't join, but later will watch the videos. And before we leave, let me just give out a few announcements. This has been an Invest in GH initiative. Invest in GH is the leading provider of financial news and education in Ghana over the years, uh, news magazines, and more recently, our webinars. One of which we are here experiencing for ourselves and educating ourselves. They are all available for streaming on our YouTube channel, Invest in GH, Invest in GH. To get in touch with us and to join the community, please do well to visit our website, www.investingh.info. 
Um, there's a short form there, just click register, complete the form with your name and then an email address that we can contact you on. And that should do. If you're unable to receive a mail from us, don't worry, just hit us up on WhatsApp. You can join any of our WhatsApp groups. The links have been made available on the chat session here. You can also find the links on our website, investinggh.info. Please do all to visit our YouTube channel to watch any of our previous webinars. We've discussed so many topics from home ownership to investing in stocks, bonds, real estate, um, the Ghana Commodities Exchange, and so many. Please visit our uh, YouTube channel, Invest in GH, watch our videos, like them and share them with your friends so that they can also get educated. And if you have any questions regarding investments or financial planning, don't worry. You can always contact any of us, any of the admins in the WhatsApp groups. Please contact the admins only, please. And if you happen to receive a message from any member of the group um, inviting you to invest in any products or any other services, please draw our attention to it. If you don't have much information about it, let us know so that we can also get more information and advise you because it's, it's a very dangerous world out there and we all have to be self-aware. So if anyone from the group invites you or introduces an investment opportunity to you that you are skeptical about, please let the administrators of the WhatsApp platforms know so that we can all protect ourselves. Also, um, our next webinar details surrounding our next webinar will be made available on the WhatsApp page. So please stay tuned. We'll be distributing the magazines as usual after the webinar maybe tonight or tomorrow. Details about this webinar will also be made available within the week in the WhatsApp groups and also via email. So you can contact Kojo or the, the First National Bank um, Home Loans Desk maybe within the week when work resumes. For those of you who are not Ghana-based, you can send an email, we'll provide all those details um, after the webinar. So stay tuned. If you have any inquiries, any questions, please contact us on our various, um, our various social media channels. Kojo, before we go, um, do you have any announcement, anything for us? Um. Well, first, I'd like to thank you very much, um, Prince, and, and your team. Um, really, really impressed by um, how these webinars are organized and, um, and, and, the, and the attendance every single time. Very impressive. So well done. And to anyone who um, couldn't get a chance to um, post their question or have other questions, um, please reach out to me either through Prince and the team or I put my number in the chat box. You can pick it up there, send me a WhatsApp. Um, but really you know, get the information from us directly. Please don't listen to um, some friend you know, sitting um, at a party somewhere telling you something about what happened to somebody else they probably haven't even met. You know, there's a lot of that that goes on where people say, somebody said this, come to us, hear it from us directly. Even if what they said was true, it might be some old um, um, policy which has since been changed. So I really encourage everyone to make Yoho via Yoho, you know, make it this year, your year of home ownership, make sure that you 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 um you get yourself on that journey um, so that you too can become a homeowner. And um, our doors are always open. Look forward to meeting as many of you as can make it um, to our to our offices um, so that we can have a conversation. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Kojo. And um, thank you also for joining us this evening. Please don't forget we'll be posting details about Heat Homes. Heat Homes, the construction company that is here to help you design and build your homes. We'll post them on the WhatsApp groups and also um, via mail so that you get to know more about Heat Homes. But you can always contact the administrators of the WhatsApp groups for more information. Thank you for joining us this evening and enjoy the rest of it. We'll see you next time. Bye.
Bye bye. Have a good evening. Oh. <laughs> bye.